This week, I am going to uh, share a presentation that I delivered to the Open Source Summit in Seattle just a few weeks ago, um, where I shared some of the lessons that, that I feel I've learned from the first two seasons of Open Source in Business. And to start with, I want to talk a little bit about why I started this journey, why I started this, this series in the first place. And if you look back about two years, uh, as there often are, there were very vibrant conversations, very animated conversations about whether uh, open source businesses were even viable. Um, you know, there were there was a spate of, of articles about license experimentation that was happening around open source. Things like the server-side public license or the um, the Commons clause that, that had been added as a codicil to uh, to some open source licenses, and I felt that this conversation was a little bit narrow and a little bit polarized, uh, because when I look around, I see hundreds, thousands of companies that are building very successful businesses on top of open source. Now, not all of them are billion-dollar companies for sure, uh, but there are many, many million-dollar companies supporting tens and and hundreds of, of employees. Um, so I felt like the, maybe the definition of success that was first and foremost in, in, in the press view of open source business um, was, was a little skewed compared to, to what I view as, as a successful project. Um, the second thread that I was seeing was a parallel conversation uh, around the potential sustainability crisis facing open source. As thousands of open source projects are supported essentially by volunteer labor. And so there have certainly been some, some valuable efforts around this that have risen. You know, the Linux Foundation Core Infrastructure Initiative, Tidelift, and Open Collective, Software Freedom Conservancy. For the most part, a lot of the attention seems to be focused on a group of initiatives that resemble to me the tip jar business model. And I wanted to learn more about what other projects are doing that are, that are sustainable, that are making themselves sustainable. I feel like there's lessons to be learned from projects who have faced down the need to get paid and who have either raised money through other business models alongside the development of the open source software. I wanted to learn more about cooperatives, uh, service subsidized open source development, the role of product marketing and, and, and product management in taking hobbyist projects to sustainable businesses. I wanted to hear about projects that came out of enterprises and spun off into successful companies. Uh, and I feel like there should be an avenue for people to learn about what worked, what's been tried, and what hasn't worked, and maybe some of the analysis of why. Most of all, I felt like the discourse around open source and business was a little bit polarized and lacking in nuance. So a couple of years ago, I um, invited a group of people, Matt AC, Stephen Wally, Leslie Hawthorne, and Deborah Bryant, uh, to brainstorm a set of topics, potential speakers, for a series of interviews that I would record live with an audience, and with some light editing, would post to YouTube afterwards. And so I started posting these videos September 2020. And uh, I'd like to share some of the lessons learned from those first two seasons for, of open source and business, and share some of the themes that we're seeing as we go forward. I've had a number of, of, uh, present, of, of speakers who have spoken about the importance of and the power of uh, communities of software developers that are congregating around a common problem that they're trying to solve. So what I found is that there's been a lot of experimentation in this area, some very, very successful projects. So I spoke to Larry Gritz of Sony Picture Image Works and Carol Payne from Netflix, who are both active participants in the Academy Software Foundation. And they shared how labor mobility and some economic drivers have really been behind the adoption and development of open source in their industry. Right, so, so the, there's two interesting things that happened, um, you know, I would say mostly between 15 and, and 10 years ago. Um, one is the the labor issue that you mentioned is that, uh, you know, the margins in this business are are small. Uh, and so there was a big transition for most of the artists uh, working on the films, um, you know, essentially being permanent hires to almost all of them across the industry being uh, hired for a particular show. And, you know, when that show wraps, you hope there's another one coming up behind it so you can just transfer them from one to the other, but that doesn't always happen. And so the labor force, um, you know, started uh, to be much more about moving from company to company with each 
project and you hope you always hope you get them back. And so that definitely set the stage for, you know, there's a lot of overhead when someone comes in, if you have to train them up on all these proprietary only tools and then they leave and they kind of resent the fact that you've filled their heads, you know, with information they can't use anywhere else. Um, and so more reliance on both standardized commercial apps, but also on these open source projects kind of means a lot more people and knowledge portability from project to project and company to company, um, which is kind of necessary. Uh, and the other thing is like the, uh, the, the these big film projects themselves, it used to be more that a big facility like, like mine or like ILM um, would take on essentially an entire movie. Um, and that was that was pretty standard until about 10 years ago. And it's actually quite rare now. Even the big places, they might, instead of getting, you know, all 1,800 shots for a movie, they might get three or 400. And, but each of five big places will get three or 400. Um, and so be, part of that is because the production schedule is compressed and they're, they're doing this work in parallel at different facilities. Um, and so that means a lot more uh, collaboration is, is necessary. And so obviously you need to share files between different studios and, and that, that's where the open file formats kind of came into their own, I guess, right? Gonna... Yeah, yeah. That, that's a lot of time. Like when I came into the industry and started, I started as a, as a technical assistant at ILM. And um, a lot of the stuff that we were doing at that time was developing pipelines around how do we, how do we share files between vendors and even between like uh subcontractors for a couple different things at ilm you know we would we would uh, we would uh, like send shots out for certain tasks and ingest them back in for others and and stuff like that and it was a lot of the things that i was working on and it's how i got introduced to open color io um, which is an open source project under the academy software foundation um, because we had to have a way to send what is the color pipeline for this project out to companies um, and, and tell them what we'd done and what we did and how to replicate. Um, so that was a big one. Um, a lot of the other big ones are that ACES falls under that too, the Academy Color Encoding System, which is the other big open source project I work on. Um, but you have to have a way to say how this image is encoded and have different facilities and different programs know exactly what to do with that. Um, so it's between software packages and it's between different companies too and so it's both of those things that intertwine together it's like that interoperability that becomes big factor in why things why open source has started to play a huge part matt klein of lyft the creator of the envoy project made a forceful argument for this model of software creation that users of the software know best what problems they should be solving and they're motivated to solve those problems I'm, I'm a big believer that when you build and operate software hand in hand, you create better software. So I, I think, especially in the infrastructure space right now, we see most of the open source and most of the products, they come from the major cloud providers, they come from venture backed startups. I think very few of the projects that have uh, found wide success come from end users, meaning they, they haven't come from users that are building it incrementally to solve business problems that they're facing at that time. So I, I really strongly believe that when you have to operate your software and you have to you know, solve real business problems that you're facing, it just leads to better software. It leads to software that is easier to operate, that has the right features for operations, um, you know, that, that actually solves real legitimate business problems. So. I felt very strongly that developing this thing at Lyft, and in some sense, Envoy is a V2 to what I had worked on at Twitter. So, you know, that that's also part of this is I had some experience building a proprietary system at Twitter, learned a lot of things from that, made lots of mistakes like all people do when they go from, you know, from a, uh, from a V1. So, Envoy took a lot of learnings there, and I felt very strongly that we had developed something good. Now, we can talk about what happened after open sourcing later, right? It's like, what, what has happened, I ne never would have imagined. But at the time, in early 2016, I think we were fairly confident that we had built something that was good, that was, you know, relatively easy to operate, that solved a bunch of business problems. We were relatively confident that other companies like Lyft in Lyft's peer group would probably find value. And I think really what the decision process was is twofold. One <clears throat> is that Envoy was not 
Lyft's primary business, right? Like Lyft is a ride sharing company. So, you know, at the time there was no plan to get into the infrastructure software business. So I think in the spirit of open source and having built some of these systems in the past and honestly just having a feeling of, well, if this is valuable to us, it must be valuable to others. This is not our core business. If we're successful here, maybe we can amplify our effort by putting it out there. I, I think that that is what pushed us to initially have these conversations. Um, but I think that, and I've said this before, I think a big part of it though, and again, we can talk about this more, is that I think a lot of us were fairly naive uh, about what was really involved in doing open source. So the initial conversations in 2016 were honestly very, very simplistic. And they basically boiled down to, we've built this thing, we think it's valuable. We don't really know how to do open source really, but it's not our core business. So let's, let's, do some open source and that's and that's about the extent of it to be honest and there were many other examples of user driven communities that i've touched on in this series from talking to uh, dr chuck severance about sakai a learning management system that was created by uh, some american universities collaborating together and that became you know a worldwide learning management system uh, the drupal ecosystem essentially grew around deployers of the software who were using it to to create websites for their customers. And we've seen uh, many industry verticals who are now adopting and developing open source offices and open source software for core business functions. And I spoke to Gil Yehuda and uh, Nithya Ruff from US Bank and Comcast respectively uh, about this during the, during the first season of the series. Another common thread that I've heard from people is that the same things that lead people to gravitate towards open source can infuse the culture of your company and help its success, that open source values matter when you're building a company. James Vazil, I think, really summed it up nicely when he shared his perspective on how open source values influenced his approach to open source consulting. I think I would just say that the power of open source is the power of the communities that it creates. And that is going to be true for your consulting practice as much as it is for your clients. And if you can build community and connection around the work that you do, and the primary way you do that is by helping other people, <laughs> um, then you start to gather some momentum and you start to gather a community that returns energy to you in the form of knowledge, network, contacts, resources, help, whatever that is that you need. And that there really is the only way to do it as far as I'm concerned. I don't see another successful set of people doing open source consulting work who aren't somewhat community minded and not just paying lip service to it, but actually working to try to better the communities that they are involved in. And so if, if that's the kind of person you are, I think you have a lot of success ahead of you. If that's not the kind of person you are, then I think you really need to consider whether this is the right path for you. And I've said this to a number of people, it's not for everybody and it's okay if it's not for you. There are so many other jobs in open source and technology and beyond. There are so many other ways to be of value to the world and to help people. This doesn't have to be it. So, you know, think about where this sits with you and how you feel about the track record you've created and where you're going with it and build on your successes and improve on your failures. But do take a hard look at, at what you're capable of as a person and emotionally, because if you can bring that kind of energy, there's a lot out there for you. Alison Gennato of Grokability shared this perspective that I really loved when I asked her how she decided whether to stop doing things and delegate in her bootstrap company. Company. One of the things that I heard over and over again from people is that what people saw as success and the things that people prioritized in their companies and projects um, are so much more diverse than just economic success and hyperskill. More, it's practically speaking, I still contribute a lot of the code, um, but there are there are also important things that I need to focus on. For example, what do I want this company to be? Who do I want this company to be? You know, one of the one of the things that we managed to accomplish this year was getting uh, healthcare for all of our employees. Um, you know, we wanted to not all of them uh, for various reasons that don't matter, but um, we got healthcare. 
we have flexible hours so that it's a nice environment for parents to be able to kind of manage their kids and and you know that's the kind of company that I wanted to build. Um, the fact that we bring on juniors, that's the kind of company that I wanted to build. And so um, I'm a little more split now because these things really do matter. And there's there is certainly some biz dev, there are some 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 strategic alliances that we've evaluated and things like that. But at the end of the day, right now, it's basically I just don't sleep a lot. <laughs> you know, I, I yeah. don't know. I don't know that I could ever stop writing code because the thing is for me, building companies and building products is that's my jam. Martin Mikos touched on some of the ethical concerns that are increasingly coming to the fore, not just in open source, but in our industry at large and how being true to your values and identity can help you navigate those tricky issues when they arise. Uh, but we have it at Hacker One at times where there are organizations who would like to be our customers. And then some people don't like those customers and say those are immoral or illegal organizations. We shouldn't help them. And that's another tricky question where we we try always to be the doctor, not the judge. We try to operate on all patients, so as so to speak, meaning help them get healthy and and help software get more secure because if software is not secure, it's bad for everybody. So we try not to look at the at who or what the organization is, as long as they are legally incorporated in a country that we can respect. But we've had a, a case where we uh, where we actually ended a program for a customer on our platform because we found their conduct to be so contradictory to the belief of ethical hacking and having a level playing field and listening to everybody's input so we we felt it wasn't they weren't true they weren't authentic in their use of our program because they didn't follow the the foundational principles that underlies ethical hacking but that those are difficult decisions and it's important i believe to be principled in those so that you don't Otherwise, you fall prey of like the 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 emotions of the moment, and emotions will change. And something which we find uh, detestable today might be acceptable tomorrow, or the other way around. So the, those are tricky questions. But that's what I love about. Sorry, I'm going off on a tangent here, but that's what I love about open source software and and ethical hacking and these collaborative commonses that exist in the world, that they force you to have a moral stance and an ethical stance and they force you to think about fairness and respectful conduct and those things like you can't hide from those questions and i think it makes society better when we are confronted with them because yeah. many people will run away from it and think that they don't have to solve them or be silent when they see something wrong happening and and that's how really bad things happen I know Martin said he was going off on a tangent, but um, some of my favorite moments of this series, I think, have have come up uh, when people do go off on tangents. It's one of the things I've really uh, enjoyed is that there's a, a huge diversity of of talent and experience in the in the people that I've interviewed. Um, the third lesson learned is that the business of open source is still business. One of the most common recurring themes in the series is that building a product on open source is not a magic bullet that there are some basic and important nuts and bolts business questions that you need to answer when starting an open source company, which are the same questions you'll need to ask in any company. These questions are things, things like, what will my product be? What will I sell? To whom? Who's my target audience? And how will I reach them? What's the differentiation between my paid offering and my free offering? What's my differentiation with respect to my competition? These are kind of business model 101 questions, but so many of my guests raised questions along these lines. It seems worth emphasizing. Astasia Myers of Redpoint Ventures at the time um, shared this perspective when I asked her whether she had, a, had different criteria for evaluating open source and proprietary companies for investment. It comes down to that we evaluate startups around four different buckets. One is really the team, two is the product, three is the market, and four is the financial and user performance to date. 
the weight that we put on each of those depends on the stage of the business, seed versus series D, and the sector that you're operating in, enterprise, consumer, financial services, healthcare. You know, at the earliest stages, we anchor on team first. We want to really make sure that people have domain expertise, leadership capabilities, and kind of grit. If you go later, you emphasize a little bit less on team simply because at that stage, there's pretty good track record of performance of the management team. So even if they maybe don't come from the category, they've proven their aptitude and their success. So it's a little less weighted the later you go. And there is some difference in an enterprise technology we look at that's closed source versus open source. So some of the details that are important for us is, is the founder of the open source startup the creator of the project and have influence over that community? Do they have um, you know, an asymmetric insight into how the architectures are going to evolve over time? And another thing that's really important for us is, do they have some like uh, advantages in terms of distribution that go beyond open source? Do they have a community that already follows them through a newsletter or podcast or social media? This is incredibly important for the earliest stages because open source businesses inherently require product-led growth. And so everything is around product and distribution and community very early. So it's nice to see some of these indicators with the open source founders that we work with. Uh, Jeff Borick uh, shared his perspective on how prospective customers make purchasing decisions, not based on any affection for a project or because they have money to burn, but instead on, on what the what value the software brings to them and how critical it is for their business. Is Dave, your 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 point earlier, who pays for free software? Who in their right mind pays for free software? And you know, you typically hear, oh, big companies do, or oh no, the financial services sector does, or uh, you know, companies that lack skills to you know sort of self-implement. And those are all wrong answers from my perspective. People that pay for software pay for it because they've developed mission critical apps that run on it. Right. And that's that's really another big part of you know Red Hat and Mongo and Suze's business model is subscription support because when it cacks in the middle of the night, which software occasionally will do, um, you Surprisingly. want someone Surprising. to call. <laughs> In our very first episode, Adam Jacob of the System Initiative shared this one anecdote that had me in stitches around what the real value proposition is for customers who pay for open source solutions. And that's where the customer product interaction comes in that says, look, it's part of the value prop here that I'm giving you with by certifying that supply chain is that I'm the one who will react to it and I'll react better than you and I'll react faster and I will get it in your hands and I will solve that problem for you right now. Yep. And, and that's one uh, of the reasons why we talk about upstream contributions. I think personally, like it's, yeah. it should not be a bragging thing. Like, Oh, we have 22% of these, you know, it's not that it's just, uh, you need to express to the customer that you have enough involvement in the supply chain. Again, you're buying enough from Bosch that Bosch will fix the fuel injector when it's broken. Right. But this is, this is, I have enough engineers or, and QE people and docs people and all kinds of people participating in this upstream community. And they have enough expertise that they'll be able to react to a broken supply chain yes. quick enough, you know, Yes, or, or just even just a bug. Like like one of my favorite Red Hat stories of all time, not to turn it into a Red Hat festival, but personal, like I had this Oracle cluster that was failing all the time, rack cluster back in the day. And it was because there was this query we were running that was smaller than the size of a kernel task struct. And the, the memory would get fragmented and then eventually the kernel couldn't allocate a task struct anymore and the server would reboot uh, because it was like, oh, can't even. And then, the, and then eventually it did that and it corrupted the on-disk file system for Oracle. And no one could figure out how to fix this problem. The Red Hat person could tell me what the problem was eventually. Eventually they were like, I think the problem was this task struct is due, like you run out of this. And then the like we had to whatever, hire this expensive dude who could like do the matrix dance and like read the raw file system. But both of those existed because there were vendors who knew that those people were real and could make them happen. Red Hat put a dude on a plane came to the sat next to me 
uh, the dude who could crack open the raw file system and read it in hex and then see the line that was wrong and be like, oh, that's wrong. And I'm like, what's wrong? He's like, see that little hex there? That's wrong. And then he typed in the fix. He just was like, boop, 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 boop. And I was like, whoa, what are you doing? And he was like, open it now. And everything was cool. And I was like, whoa, that is the scariest thing I've ever seen in my life. And like, but that's, that is, that is the product. That's the product. That's um, the product. And, 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 you know, it's not because it, that can devolve into saying the product is support. It's not, it's not support. Like, yes, in that instance, it's the support that I got, but it's the whole thing. It's the, it's the fact that that exists, that those people are there. It's that, that you have that 20% of the engineers who, you know, you can influence that roadmap, who could fix that Kubernetes book, even if the other people in Kubernetes don't care, you know, Red Hat cares and that's all that matters. One of the themes that I noticed is the extent to which people attributed a crucial role to commercial community engagement and growth in early stage development of a company. Making software easy and quick to use and growing a large user community is really one of the key differences between proprietary and open source companies. And any move that might harm community adoption in the early days is to be avoided. Astasia Myers has emphasized ease of adoption and early community engagement as being a key factor in startup success that we've partnered with and those that have become successful you know all enterprise businesses have a few things that we look for is the technology you know really solving a key pain point is the software easy to implement use and maintain does it provide a delightful customer experience these are you know first principles for any type of investing particularly enterprise but something that's really important for open source led business models is the ease of implementation. We really look at, can you get up and running as a user within 30 minutes and have a uh, time to value and a really short time horizon? Are you writing an open source project that's in a common language so that you have a large user base that could come and use it like Go or JavaScript or Python? And really, are you is the open source enabling you to simplify a really complex problem or workflow that makes it easy to adopt. Um, something that's also a little bit different about open source than traditional enterprise startups we look at is the role of community and users really early in the company's life cycle. Um, you know, companies that open source startups that do a really good job of engaging the community, listening to them and becoming a trusted partner to those users in the context of their solution, but also the ecosystem at large tend to perform much better. And so for open source companies, typically, even when you get to about, you know, two pizza teams of engineers, you start to look for a DevRel leader to help with that engagement in the community. And I asked Martin Mikos if there was ever any tension at MySQL between community adoption and sales. He attributed ease of adoption and a good user experience as a key factor in the early growth of MySQL and something that was crucial to its long-term long success. Without giving, without giving money back, were that, that there was a concern that it was lost sales? Oh, that way? Sure, like some people will say so. Like some sales reps are like, "Why are there all these people who pay nothing?" But but at the core of the company, we had made a commitment. We had picked the license we liked, and then you live with it. Like the, you choose your own license. If you don't like the open source model, don't choose such a license. But we did, right. and we intentionally wanted everybody to use it because that gave us powers that were far larger than. Oracle's powers. Like I remember when there was a time when Oracle had 50,000 employees and we had 50,000 downloads every day. And I said, look at them. They have 50,000 people who drag their feet as they work to work. They, they must be paid a salary and they don't necessarily are, they are not necessarily motivated and passionate about what they do. They just hang in there because they need a salary. We get 50,000 new people every day full of passion, drive, a voluntary power to do amazing things. And we get 50,000 of them every single day. So the power of our community was far larger than the power of the whole employee base of Oracle, which at the time was the sort of the, the Goliath that we were the David to.
I asked Stephen O'Grady of Redmonk about the potential for tension between community and product compared to managed services, where the installation and integration experience is often a core selling point for the product. And his answer touched on the crucial, imp critical importance of making your project easy to adopt to reach the ubiquity you hope for in an open source project. You know, part of that is, um, you know, sort of in, inherent to the model. And frankly, it's one of the reasons that I recommend, uh, you know, to all of our clients effectively, that they should go the managed route. You know, because in other words, the advantage of the managed service route, you know, from a, a commercial open source organization standpoint is that you can put out exactly the same product and you are cleanly and clearly differentiated, right? Which is, hey, here's the product. If you want to go run it yourself, knock yourself out, right? Have fun. Um, but if you want, you know, if you want sort of this this project as run and instantiated and maintained by professionals, then, you know, we're the people to, to come talk to you about that. Um, so there isn't any sort of clean, there's, you know, and, and you know this, and I'm sure probably many of the people sort of watching this know this, when you, um, when you are competing with, you know, sort of uh, community and enterprise editions, there's always going to be that tension. Uh, there isn't sort of any clean way to, to look at it. Um, but to your point, you know, you do have to think about sort of, okay, if we make this, you know, really inconvenient to use um, and really inconvenient to sort of pick up and run with, um, what are the implications for that long term, right? Because typically it's not good, right? Um, you're going to have uh, in, in probably in most cases, you know, sort of problems with adoption, um, you know, problems with usage and problems with, uh, you know, essentially getting to the ubiquity that you want um, and in mm -hmm. fact need, you know, for a lot of open source commercial models. A hot topic this year has been the idea that there is a software supply chain and that this supply chain needs to be managed, cured. It's also been a recurrent theme throughout the first season of the Open Source and Business series and was in fact the core topic of our very first episode last year. When I spoke to Adam Jacob of the System Initiative and Scott McCarty of Red Hat last year, Scott shared his theory as an open source product manager uh, that thinking about upstream open source projects is essentially the same as thinking about a component supplier for a physical product. I always launch with my, my pitch of like, I try to view open source as a supply chain for products, just like I would view any technology supply chain, whether you're building airplanes or cars or anything else. For example, like people ask, well, should I be going to DevCon, for example, people at Red Hat? And the the answer, you know, product managers in particular, and you're like, well, it depends. Are you is you know, is System D or Podman or any of these other like low level projects in the supply chain for the product that you're building? For me, that happens to be true. So it's an absolute yes, right? It's the same thing as if I was an auto manufacturing and Bosch had a fuel injector conference and I was the product manager of you know powertrain systems or whatever. Of course, I would go to the you know the 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 Bosch conference and like try to influence Bosch on whatever features they're going to add for my, you know, I would try to influence what I want for my product. This is the beauty of software in general combined, combined with open source. These two things together are magical compared to the fuel injector because the fuel injector costs $5 to manufacture and I just have to pay $7. Like I have to give Bosch enough money that they can make a profit and stay alive. And so this natural tendency to try to reduce the cost in the supply chain is a natural thing in all products. And so open source actually does this out of the box. Like again, as a PM, I look at it as it's a it's a nonprofit entity that doesn't have sales and marketing costs that's still building a great like supply chain product for me essentially that I don't have to go pay for and if I pay, if the way I pay is I dedicate engineers to it so say I dedicate three engineers that cost hundred thousand dollars each I'm dedicating three hundred thousand dollars but I might be getting back a million dollars in product or five easy. million dollars easy easy yeah. I mean it's like easy. outrageous the return on investment from open source like uh, you know it's just so much better than a physical supply chain so it's a no brainer in a lot of ways when I talked to Limor Freed Jason Kreidner and Alicia Gibb about the open hardware ecosystem Limor shared a huge positive aspect uh, to having open source and open hardware components in your technology supply chain open designs open documentation for interfaces and open source all give you the ability to use and update the hardware and software, even if something should happen to the vendor you bought it from. Um, we just saw that um, the ILM team uh, that does the Mandalorian, they used some of our NeoPixel rings in the model making of like the Razor Crest, the spaceship in this show. Did we design the NeoPixel rings for use? 
by ILM to make models. No, we designed it because we went to this goth club and this cool like goggle project we saw. We're like, we should make that, but like with like RGB LEDs. And so we made this product because I personally wanted this like weird cosplay project, but then it got used for other purposes because they're, you know, these this team, which is like, you know, Disney ILM, they have all the money, right? Like nobody has more money than the team working on Baby Yoda. Right. Like I wish I had their budget. <laughs> they could buy anything, right? They could they could have a custom engineer like design a custom board if they need to, but they didn't. Instead, they were like, "Here's some open source hardware that we can customize to make this cool flame effect on the spaceship, um, to make the controllers that we need to to do this special effects quickly and on the on a smaller budget than we need to, so we can spend the rest of the money on cheeseburgers and drinks." Um, you know, we have companies like, you know, SpaceX and Apple, they buy our components. What do they use it for? I don't fucking know. Like whatever they want. Right. Cause it's like, they, they get to do whatever they want. They don't have to sign documentation or NDAs with me. Right. They buy the hardware, um, and use it for oh, whatever. When the FDA had it's... to do fast track ventilator work, um, folks used our hardware. Why? Because they had to quickly get known working hardware with microcontrollers and sensors to make ventilators. They had to do it in like less than a month. Um, they, they wanted something that was well documented, well understood, and that they didn't have to worry about what if this company, you know, I hate to say it, but they go out of business. Like I see people who do, you know, they have hardware products that they sell them. The company goes out of business and the hardware's bricked. They can't use it anymore. There's no documentation. If you have a ventilator, you don't want your ventilator to get bricked. That's bad. You, it, should, it should work forever, right? Uh, it should be easy to repair. Um, and, you know, if you're going to do an open source quick turn ventilator, that's important. So open source hardware fulfills many of these um, niches, but they're all kind of the same. Engineers have to get a product done to market that works, that's well documented, that doesn't kill them in the production cycle. Okay. Uh, there's nothing worse than an engineer making a decision to go down some technical path and then realizing a month later that they're totally screwed because the documentation isn't complete. They can't get the support they need. Um, you know, the company folds, whatever. Uh, with open source hardware, you don't have to worry about that, which is kind of nice, right? Yeah. You buy it and you have it forever. As long as the, the physicalness of it exists, the support and software will work. And I think people who do software know the same thing. It's like, would you use a library if like you couldn't we compile it when the new mac os big sur comes out and like everything breaks no that sucks it's better for using open source tools that you can then adapt and upgrade um, as technology improves and like i have lots of software that doesn't work on big sur so i know that this is an issue so um with the passage of time this upcoming themes and guests is now a set of um existing themes and guests that you can find on this channel um the season three highlights so far have included um, a discussion I had around sustainable humanitarian free and open source software with Laura Walker McDonald, um, a conversation I had with Miguel de Catha, which we ended up titling um, No Good Deed Goes Unpunished, uh, which talked about how uh, he, he experienced the highs and lows of open source development from starting to work on open source as a developer and launching two companies uh, that were based around open source projects to also being a target for some pretty severe harassment uh, over a decade ago. I spoke to Jim Fruchterman of Benetech, a company that's been around for 30 years as a nonprofit in the heart of Silicon Valley, using technology for, for great, the greater good, hum, the, the good of humanity. And, uh, and I've also spoken to Ben Adida, on uh, open source in civics, open source in, in elections. Uh, ben is the executive director of Voting Works, a nonprofit which is building open hardware specification and open source software for uh, running physical voting machines in, in, in voting booths in, in the United States. Um, so these have been fascinating conversations so far, and we've got more coming. But in the meantime, uh, May I ask you to subscribe to the Open Source and Business channel? Visit the op Open Source and Business website, osbusiness.org.